Welcome everyone to uh, our Seek Space webinar series. We want to thank you for joining us today. I know that many of you are joining us remotely. Uh, if you have any issues, we'll try to address them efficiently and we appreciate your patience. Also to let you know that one of our speakers, Dr. Doug Fowler, was not able to join us today, but we are working to reschedule his presentation. Today's webinar is from our excellent panel of speakers, is about methods of functional annotation of genetic variants. Before turning it over to Fred Schumacher, who will introduce our speaker, I want to review some webinar logistics. All lines during this webinar will be in listen-only mode. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A or chat panel and select all panelists, and Tabitha Harrison will ask it on your behalf during the Q&A session. You may need to activate this panel by um, using the floating navigation panel, and this will be found on the center of your screen. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you should see this panel and you see this little bubble where you can open your chat and Q&A window, and that's what you see on the left of this slide. Note that closed captioning is available by clicking the link in the chat box, and that this webinar is being recorded. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Fred Schumacher, who can introduce our speaker. Thank you. Today we have a panel of speakers that we're presenting on function presenting on different methods of functional annotation of genetic variants. Our panelists today are Dr. Frederick Roth, who is the Canadian, Canadian, Canada Excellence Research Chair in Integrative Biology and Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. We also have Dr. Rachel Karchin, who is the William R. Brody Faculty Scholar in the Institute for Computational Medicine at the School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University, as well as Professor of Oncology and Computer Science at Johns Hopkins University. We also have Dr. Jing Wan Zhang, who is the Chair of the Department of Computational Biology and the St. Jude Endowed Chair in Bioinformatics at St. Jude's Research Hospital. Now we'll transition over to Dr. Roth. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to try to share my screen here. Um, somebody could give me some feedback that you can see. It. That'd be great. Yeah, we can see your slides. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I see a bunch of friends and collaborators in the in the group here. So some, some people who know as much about this or more than I do. So I look forward to the Q&A. Uh, so I'm going to go very quickly through uh, some background and an example application of systematic experimental testing of variant functions um, with the goal of doing experimental testing proactively, um, often before we've seen a variant in a, in a human. So the outline is background on variant effect mapping. I'm going to go into more detail on one uh, map or set of maps, uh, variant effect maps for the MTHFR gene, and uh, then a couple of quick concluding slides. So uh, probably many of you are here because you are well aware of this problem, but it's estimated that each of us carries 100 to 400 rare missense variants. And, uh, you know, of course, not all of those are in disease-associated genes. Um, but uh, when variants do need to be interpreted, missense variants need to be interpreted, the majority of missense variants um, are given the designation variants of unknown significance or uncertain significance, which is considered a not a clinically actionable result. So um, the major motivation here is to try to change that. And uh, so, you know, maybe the current paradigm is a patient comes in to the clinic with a, a, a symptom that makes one think that we should do genetic testing, uh, and then a variant is found, and then a functional assay is run. And for all but a, a few genes, uh, there isn't really a, a, an industry around testing variants. For rare diseases, this often has to wait months and years until uh, this is taken on as a research project. So the idea is to make these maps ahead of time so that for each amino acid position in a protein of interest, for each of the um, 20 amino acids or other than 19 substitutions away from the wild type they're shown in yellow, for each of the possible missense variants, uh, let's measure it and get a score. Here blue is bad and white is neutral and red is the um, rarer scenario where the uh, variant performs better in the assay than uh, the wild-type clone. Uh, 
so the idea is to put a score on every variant in this map ahead of time so that when someone comes into the clinic with a new variant never seen before, hey, we've already done the experiment, um, or in the case of computational work, we've done the analysis and can get a clinical interpretation, at least you know, have that evidence feed into a clinical interpretation. Of course, functional evidence is only one part of the current um, guidelines for interpreting variants clinically. Okay, so uh, what I'm about to, you know, that idea and, and some of the techniques I'm about to go through um, we didn't invent. So we, I was inspired originally by a talk from Stan Fields and later by one from Doug Fowler. And I um, and we've benefited greatly from collaboration with Doug's lab and Rio Data. And I, I saw Kenny Atreak is in the call here today. And so lots of great people doing good work here. And we're just part of that community. Um, a lot of the earlier work um, as a functional assay used um, protein interaction. Um, not all of it, but our focus has mainly been on using uh, functional um, complementation or rescue assays. So the basic idea is you start with uh, a normal cell and uh, you have a phenotype if you knock out um, the, the gene of interest. And um, I, the most convenient one, of course, is cellular fitness. And if the loss of fitness can be rescued by bringing back the human gene, um, then you have an assay. So now you can put individual variants in and see if the variant clone is able to rescue. And so if it is still able to rescue even with the variant, then your best guess is that it's tolerated. And if it doesn't, then your best guess is that the variant is damaging. Okay, so the framework that we're uh, following mostly in my group um, is, uh, you know, when others have followed similar frameworks. Um, we've developed a, a mutagenesis method that we call pop code, which is really a, a scaling up of a, of a previously developed oligo-directed mutagenesis method. I'm not going to go into that, but it's published, and I'm happy to talk more about it if you like. But the idea is to do mutagenesis first, and that, um, as many people have done single nucleotide mutagenesis, sort of noisy PCR, we do oligo-directed uh, codon mutagenesis, where uh, each all, for every code on an oligo is made, and the central three uh, bases are an NNK degenerate uh, sequence, meaning um, a degeneracy that can get you all 20 amino acids uh, and only one of the stop codons. So we try to cut back on stop mutations. So that PCR amplicon is mutagenized, and then that library is moved en masse into a vector. We use the gateway system. Um, so these are put in sort of a, a library of what's called entry clones that can be easily moved into any other um, plasmid of interest with the, the right um, site-specific recombination sites. So um, what I'm going to give an example of today is a yeast assay where the, we have a yeast cell that is rigged so that it depends for life on the human gene. But we're also doing work with help from, uh, from Kenny Matreik and Doug Feller um, in human cell lines. And, uh, but today I'll talk about the yeast, uh, an example in yeast. So the idea is having put the human gene, all these different variant copies, one per cell, into cells addicted to the function of the human gene, we do a little population genetics experiment. So it's a little lab evolution where uh, at the start of the selection, we let the yeast grow and the variants that allow um, function of the human gene allow growth. And so those allele frequencies um, should either stay the same or actually rise a little bit because of all the clones that are disappearing. Um, and so we're looking for drop in allele frequency. And the way we read that out is by um, deep sequencing. So we have these little tiles, um, we call this tile C, of about 150 nucleotides wide, um, where we take that amplicon and we sequence both strands. Uh, we've used Illumina so far, but other platforms are possible. And, uh, and we measure allele frequency and basically count how often we see in 2 million reads or so on um, each amino acid, and then we look for cases where it drops. And so sometimes we don't have a variant well enough represented pre-selection uh, to say anything, and those are marked in gray, but um, generally if we've done things right, um, every um, missense variant is pretty well represented, and we can look for drops or unstable um, a little frequency. So, so again, white is neutral and blue is bad and yellow is the 
and we do we can fill in some of the missing data if there's enough information at a given amino acid position uh, there's enough uh, correlation between the answers you get from different amino acid substitutions that we can uh, basically interpolate or impute um, some missing data afterwards. okay so uh, overall just for the big picture uh, my group has um, done maps for 14 proteins so far and for many of them we've done multiple maps and some of them are better than others, um, but uh, in terms of, of actual genes, um, here are the maps we've um, completed. And I'm going to give the example of MTHFR today, but there are many others. And uh, you know, we're, we're making maps, unfortunately, faster than we can publish them. So it's only uh, five published so far, more in the way. And so I'm happy to take uh, emails from people later if there's a gene on there that, that gets you interested. Uh, we love to collaborate. Okay. So uh, the human MTHFR gene, it doesn't stand for what you think it does. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. And I'll give a little bit uh, more detailed background on that. But first, um, why am I picking this example? I'm excited about it because um, of this idea that having made a bunch of maps, um, we hadn't fully uh, tackled the challenge of modeling not only um, the functional effect of each variant, but how does that variant effect change in different environments and genetic backgrounds? So we know that, um, that the effects of genetic variation can be context dependent. So I wanted to begin uh, to tackle that here with the MTHFR project. So MTHFR is uh, a member of the, an enzyme that's a member of the one carbon metabolism pathway. And uh, if you have defects in MTHFR, it can cause sort of a, a backup in this in this pathway that leads to a buildup of homocysteine. Um, CBS is sort of highlighted a bit here because we have another now published project on CBS, but I'm just going to talk about MTHFR. And uh, so that in terms of disease relevance, the first cases were discovered in the 70s, 1970s, and um, quickly it was um, realized that this was an enzyme defect and uh, Folic acid or folinic acid, I'm going to use those terms kind of interchangeably because they are interchanged quickly in the cell. Um, but, uh, folic acid was found to help some people, um, but not others um, to some degree. And, uh, and so that sort of makes sense because uh, the levels of folate can control the levels of the tetrahydrofolate um, substrate for this reaction. And so in some sense, uh, this is makes sense in terms of mass action, just driving more product, um, more reactant um, into the reaction. Um, but it's also interesting because um, the folic acid levels um, can control the amount, uh, sort of the strength with which the cofactor FAD binds to the enzyme. So it's not quite so simple as just mass action. And, and I'll, I may come back to that. Um, anyway, uh, fast forward, the gene was cloned and a couple of groups have worked on uh, this yeast based complementation assay and Jasper Lines group in particular, this is the version we adopted because they also knocked out a folate um, metabolism gene so they could make the cell reliant on externally supplied folate. So that'll become um, important. So uh, the other bit of background is, um, you know, maybe their clinical geneticist will set me straight, but I've been told by some that the MTHFR variant um, A222V is um, perhaps one of the most hated variants by clinical geneticists. And that's not because it's particularly bad, but because it's particularly common. And so they have to counsel so many people on it um, in, a, in a sort of a way that you know, maybe not a good use of everybody's time. Um, so worldwide, the allele frequency of this variant is 30%. So I mean, half of us have at least one copy of it. Uh, at least half of us have one copy of it. Uh, and uh, so it is functional. So it's, this variant activity is about 65% of the wild type activity. Um, it's clear that if you don't get enough folate in your diet, a pregnant mother, uh, a pregnant woman can uh, get neural tube defects. Um, so that's obviously bad, but in, in one sense, uh, it's good news because if you get the high folate diet, there's no evidence that it matters. And there are other associations, but those are somewhat controversial. And 23andMe advises people not um, really to worry about it other than getting enough folate. Um, 
Okay, so to make a very long story short, we did eight maps uh, for MTHFR in this yeast assay um, at four different folinic acid concentrations in the wild type background, clone background. But then we did it all again in the same four folinic acid concentrations where every clone not only has the variants that we mutagenized in, but every clone has this A222E background. Um, so, uh, so basically, it allows us um, not only to look at deleteriousness of variants, but by changing folate levels, we can think about how they respond to folate levels, and uh, we can see how they depend on this common variant. So, the first one of the first things we looked at is this A22E variant. What did it, what did our wild type background map say? For that one variant in our map. And uh, sure enough, it does agree with the literature that it seems to be damaging in function and um, more damaging at low folate levels. Uh, that was reassuring. And now this is a segment of the map where taking our four values, we can sort of smoothly interpolate between uh, folinic acid concentrations and uh, visualize what the map looks like at different folinic acid levels. And I should say that um, the dashed lines or X's. Um, are ways of representing the amount of error, um, measurement error that we uh, estimate that the, um, that the measurement has. So many of these are changing um, because the measurement uh, error levels are high, but there are others that are changing uh, in a more consistent way. Uh, so, for example, there's one position here, there's a um, tryptophan uh, where almost every change at this position that we could measure is damaging but really only at low folate levels. So this is interesting when we're following this up in collaboration with Sean Fusel and YAU and others. Uh, but we don't, uh, it's just sort of interesting because this looks like it may be kind of a sticky latch at the end of a flap over the active site that contains both the FAD flow factor and the active site. Uh, so uh, one take home from this is that in the wild type background, um, and these red and green color uh, schemes are somewhat arbitrary, but uh, the idea is that there aren't too many variants changing uh, between damaging and not damaging, uh, but uh, between at different folate levels. But you can see that there are, um, you know, there's slightly more variants that we deem harmful uh, at low folate levels. So that sort of makes sense that there's some folate dependent changes. But the striking thing was how. Uh, many more there were in the A222V background. So even if A222V itself is not particularly damaging, it's quite interesting that it may, um, maybe we should be more concerned about uh, if you have another variant, whether it's in that background or not. So that's one of the take-homes. Uh, so that was a very quick glimpse at what will be a longer story and coming out um, soon, I hope. Um, and then just a couple of concluding thoughts. Um, can we do this? Uh, how many genes can we do this for? So we have about 4,000 annotated human disease genes, including both uh, you know, cancer, somatically mutated genes, as well as germline uh, disease genes. Maybe 5 to 10% um, will be able to work out a yeast assay. Um, for the bulk of it, we're going to have to go somewhere else, though. And, um, and as a proxy assay, one could think about using interaction as both a stability um, and, uh, and functional assay. Uh, and, but so maybe 40% have a yeast to hybrid interaction that one could use. Um, but actually, the, I think the future is going to be doing human cell-based human cell based, um, functional complementation. Uh, so right now in the high throughput CRISPR um, data, um, 70 to 80%. And of course, there are some false positives in that data. Um, but it, it actually doesn't drop by that much when you demand that there's a phenotype in multiple cell lines. So uh, 70 to 80% of human disease genes have some phenotype in a cell, cell line in the high throughput CRISPR studies. So I think there's a lot of promise for a large fraction of human disease genes to set up one of these scalable assays. Uh, just a shout out um, to the MAVEDB database that we've uh, put together. This is really driven and largely by Alan Rubin and Doug Fowler's uh, groups, and, and we've contributed some. And, uh, and so this is a database that stores this kind of variant effect mapping data. I encourage you to go check it out. Um, and uh, so just to summarize, I gave an overview of systematic experimental variant effect mapping 
and then gave one example from MTHFR where we showed that both environment and genetic background can alter the landscape for functional variation and, and more importantly maybe that we can experimentally begin to measure that. Thanks. Uh, just to, I wanted to thank a few people here. Um, a lot of the work was driven by Jochen, Song, and Nishka, but really it's a cast of many, and we've had great collaborators as well. Uh, thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, next up is Rachel Carson. No. All right, so I'm going to talk today about Open Cravat, the Open Custom Ranked Analysis of Variance Toolkit. And Open Cravat was designed to address the issue that variant interpretation is extremely important, and there are different types of information about variants, but they are scattered all over the internet. Um, there are databases of population allele frequencies. There are many, many methods that do computational prediction of variant deleteriousness or pathogenicity or whether variants are cancer drivers. There's a lot of information out there in the literature. There, there is information about clinical relevance uh, of variants from a number of sources. And there's also a lot of information about variant impact from protein-protein interactions. So given that there is so much information out there, I, how does a researcher start to interpret a set of variants that they've collected? And it turns out that it's quite tricky. Uh, the data is scattered all over the place. The computational programs may be very difficult to install and run. Uh, there are many, many websites. Uh, with material, but how do, how do you put it all together in one place? And that's the idea of Open Cravat. So it's a software package, and I'll tell you about the many forms that we're offering it in. Uh, here's a general paradigm for how you might use Open Cravat. And just consider that this could be variation in a single sample, it could be a few variants, or it could be variants from an entire cohort that you're analyzing. So Open Cravat has been designed to scale uh, up to uh, tens, even hundreds of samples. So the way it works is you begin with your list of input variants. Um, you're then going to go to our store, and yes, we have an Open Cravat store, and select appropriate annotation resources out of uh, what we're hoping is soon going to be hundreds of choices that you can make. You then run your annotation job for your particular variants, and this will allow you to both filter your variants and identify the most important ones, um, and also analyze all the variants that you have. And we've also designed Open Cravat so that once you've finished your analysis job, you can save your results, you can export them to a variety of formats, and you can share them with others for collaborative work. We also considered that in our user community that there's a wide range of programming experience. So while the graphical interface that I'm going to mainly talk about today can be used by people who don't program at all, we're also interested in users, we're interested in power users who will use Open, open Cravat um, as a platform for programming. So pretty much everything that you can do in the GUI, you can also do on the command line. You can locally install Open Cravat on your own laptop, and if you're a programmer and you're used to working with Python and PIP, this is, uh, you can install just a single PIP command. You can also install a multi-user server version with PIP. Um, we have several uh, cloud instantiations, so we call Open Cravat OC for short. Um, for very, very large jobs, you probably want to use a cloud instance. If your data is not protected, we have put up one.opencravat.org, which is a public website. Uh, that you can use to run Open Cravat, but of course your data will not be private 
on run.opencravat.org. However, you don't have to install anything. And for users at NIH, Open Cravat is now on BioWolf, and you can run it with this module load Open Cravat command. So Open Cravat is, is available for Mac, Windows, and Linux, and when you install, you get both the command line and the GUI implementation all packaged together. All right, so I'm going to present the rest of the talk uh, in the form of a tutorial. We're going to go through this flow uh, in the figure I'm showing on the right here. So we'll begin with this step of selecting annotations from the App Store. And yes, we have an App Store. Uh, we have tried to reduce these hundreds of sources of variant annotations, uh, including what we hope are your favorites and maybe also ones you've never heard of. But we've tried to bring them into uh, our system in the form of pre-computes. So when you use Open Cravat, you're never directly installing a software tool, but you're, download, you're downloading a pre-computed, um, saturated, comprehensive set of predictions. Or you are downloading a database such as Cosmic or ClinVar. Um, we're very interested in opening up our store so these apps can be directly submitted to the store by outside developers. If you're running on the command line, you can simply view everything in the store with this OC module ls command. Just want to keep uh, showing you that anything you can do in the GUI with Open Cravat, you can also do uh, from a programmatic standpoint. There are three types of modules in the App Store. So first we have converters, which handle different types of input formats, which may include VCS, uh, text files, Ancestry, 23andMe formats. We're taking lists of dbSNP IDs and genes. We are continuing to develop these input format converters. So on the, out, on the other end, we have output format reporters. So you can view your uh, results in in a GUI, you can get annotated DCF files, you can get Excel files, text files. And then, of course, the heart of the system is the modules, which are annotators. Uh, and these cover a large number of categories. So here are some of the modules that we currently have in the store. Here's a snapshot of what the store looks like. Uh, annotators, converters, and reporters are all tagged, so you can pretty easily bring them up uh, with this checkbox system. Um, really importantly, for those of you on the call, uh, we, ha we have over 100 tools currently available, but we would like to make this a really comprehensive resource. So we are looking for new collaborations, we're looking for new apps to put into the store, and if you're the developer of a tool or you just have a beloved tool that you'd like to see in the store, uh, please get in touch with me and let me know. We, we're very interested in working with you. So the store, as you can see, is organized by tiles, similar to when you go into iTunes. If you click on a tile, it flips around, uh, and we have documentation about the resource, uh, citation, uh, link outs to the resource, uh, and you can simply click if you're working on your local system and you want to install the particular resource, you just click on this install button, which is on the reverse side of the tile. Okay, so for a local installation, you probably have to be pretty choosy. You can see we have the size of the data in each tool on the tile, but some of the tools are quite large. Um, uh, some of them are even up to 8, 10 gigabytes. So if you're interested in working with some of the larger annotators, you may want to move to our server uh, and cloud versions that have all the app data preloaded. And then you don't have to worry about limited disk space on your computer. All right, so once you've selected your annotations from the store, you are ready to run an open cravat job. And with the GUI, uh, you can use the submission pane, which allows you to select a 
local file that contains your variants. You can pick your choice of genome assembly. You can pick your annotations. So any annotation that you have installed from the store appears in this Aqua box here, and you get to, oops, you get to click on the annotation that you want. I think as I'm moving my pointer mouse, I'm advancing slides, which I won't do. You click on the annotate button and your jobs run, and then you maintain a, uh, a history of your jobs, which you can see over here on the right. You can also run open cravats in the command line uh, using these uh, flags to show the reference genome, input format, your list of annotators, and so forth. All right, so once you've run your job, you get into the real meat of the analysis where you want to filter and analyze your variants. So you can either download your files and the files that you get are determined by the reporters you've selected, or you can open our GUI results viewer. You can also do it on the command line with this OC GUI command. The first thing you get when you open the viewer is a summary tab that gives you an overview of all the variants that you submitted. We have different widgets here. Uh, we have summaries of sequence ontologies of your variants, of your samples. We have a circo summary of where all your variants are located. This tab is a bit of a sanity check to make sure nothing went horribly wrong with your job. Um, if you have submitted a very large number of variants, probably the next thing you want to do is filter down a bit. We have a filter system set up so you can, if you submitted many samples, you can look at variants that are in only one sample, or you can select just certain samples. Maybe you'd like to see uh, variants that appear only in a certain subset of your samples. Uh, we also have simple smart filters where you can narrow down your variants by population allele frequencies, uh, you can look at coding variants, variants in ClinVar, and we also have some very elaborate filters. So if you want to go to town uh, and put in some very, very specific criteria to pull out a set of variants you're interested in, you can do that too with our query builder for advanced and complex filters. Your variants can be displayed in the GUI on a flexible dynamic table that is paired with a widget panel. And you can search for things in this dynamic table. You can sort things. You can hover over headers. You can hide columns, rearrange them. And once you get your display looking exactly like you like it, you can save it. And then you can share your saved display with others. Uh, by sharing your MySQLite file that summarizes all your results, which is one of our output formats. All right, we also have these interactive widget panes, which um, have more detail and more link outs than what you see in the columns of the table. The table and the widgets are highly synchronized and coordinated together. And the, widget, the widgets contain some dynamic graphics you can work with. You can look at uh, network views of genes that were important in your study that have variants that were scored as having a strong impact. You can see what genes and proteins uh, interact with your gene of interest. You can drill down to the protein level and look at protein domains. Um, and there are various uh, very colorful interactive widgets. You can look at your variants on protein structures. You can even look at your variants in an embedded version of the integrated genomics viewer to observe things on the read level. You can drill all the way down to the read level. Uh, we have tab tab tabs not only for variants, but for genes. And uh, I'm going to quickly just move along. I think I'm pretty much out of time here, just to show that Depending on your choice of output file reports, uh, you can get many different ways uh, of saving your output, uh, including these, uh, these SQLite files that allow you to directly share your GUI views, filters, and preferences. 
And we are actively developing some more, some prettier variant reports. So this is one single variant report we've been working on, and we are working with the Molecular Tumor Board at Hopkins to develop uh, variant reports that they can work with directly in their tumor board meetings. We're very interested in developing more of these customized variant reports. If you have ideas or requests for variant reports, please let me know about that as well. And finally, we are trying to build a community of people interested in variant annotation who want to contribute tools to our system. And we've been putting together hackathons where developers can work together to develop better tools or in the case of some existing tools, to actually work on the cloud with us to make genome-wide pre-computes uh, for their tools that can be easily uploaded to our store. So we're scheduling a hackathon in June in Baltimore and in October in San Diego as part of ASHG. And we, I hope that some of you will join us for those hackathons. So thank you very much for your time. Our, our goal really is to reduce the barrier to perform really high throughput analysis of genetic variation, regardless of your level of computational expertise. Thank you again. Uh, can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, we can see yes. your screen. Okay. Um, so I'll start. Um, it was good that I'm the third speaker of the session because um, I actually can primarily demonstrate the real life experience of variant pathogenicity classification uh, in research and the clinical setting. So. Um, Get started that, uh, uh, you know, in the research, we usually work a patient cohort um, for somatic variant uh, classification that we will perform statistical tests uh, looking for mutational uh, enrichments and finding driver genes and publish paper. That's kind of the, uh, kind of the standard workflow of uh, looking at the variant of significance uh, in, uh, in tumor samples. Uh, in the clinic, uh, you don't have the luxury of working on the cohort, so you have working around the clock, analyzing one patient at a time, and sign out, classify the variant individually, and sign out the case report. So these two work modes actually can uh, enhance uh, each other in that way that the single patient classification will depend on established uh, knowledge based on the patient cohort. On the other side, uh, the methods that we developed for individual patient uh, classification can also enable classifying variants in a cohort that you lack the statistical power, but you uh, were able to classify based on the case-dependent uh, uh, case uh, model. So last, the last subject I will talk about is how to integrate RNA sequencing data for DNA variant classification this actually can turn out to be a very powerful tool on um, uh, identifying some of the non-coding regulatory variants that cannot be classified by the standard protein uh, domain-based model. So our journey started with a need to classify um, a large cohort of over 1,000 uh, pediatric cancer patients for cancer susceptibility mutations, and this is a study we published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. So to accomplish that, we basically designed a work model that um, incorporates variant detection, QC, and population filter that actually incorporating uh, not only the, um, the variant curation, but also the sample curation as well, because um, we have to account for tumor in normal contamination to rule out the variants that contaminate from the tumor specimen. And there's also, um, building up assortment of the databases uh, from diverse uh, public domains, uh, including some that Rachel already uh, mentioned. 
So some of the unique aspects of our uh, working models is to incorporate a curated uh, somatic mutation databases, including COSMIC and our own PDH cancer database called uh, PDH Cancer Genome Project, uh, PCGP uh, variants, into this uh, curation system. And then there is a panel discussion that incorporating uh, pedigree information, literature, and functional data, and genotype, phenotype correlation, and RNA-seq variation, and to define the variants into the five classes, uh, classes of uh, pathogenic, like, likely pathogenic variant of unknown significance, likely benign, and benign, these four models, or five uh, classes. So while working on the, uh, that study, we recognize there need to be an automated uh, system to uh, really, um, you know, uh, streamline the process. So we developed a tool called Metal Ceremony, which is a triage tool starting with a variant, uh, on, you know, a list of the variants of interest going through population frequency filter and then uh, went through uh, what we called a high quality databases uh, that looking for good variants of interest, and also another set of the less confident databases for classifying silver variants. We also implement a model when there's a size match, but not the exact allele match to downgrade the variant, uh, you know, um, to a different class. And then uh, there's uh, nothing fits into these models that they go, go to the browns. So these were actually developed in, so, uh, I think, two Olympic uh, games uh, ahead. So it was sad to hear that uh, the Tokyo Olympic Games is delayed this time. And for each of the variants, they actually receive a somatic medal and a germline medal uh, that we can evaluate them in the context if it were a somatic or germline. So the entire system actually can be accessed on St. Jude Cloud. You can either click the link here to get to uh, this uh, workflow we call the pecan pie, and it was named uh, after a very famous southern dish, so it stands for variant annotation and pathogenicity classification. And uh, uh, this paper was published in uh, Genome Research uh, last year. You could also just search for uh, St. Jude Cloud and then looking at the tool section and get to this page uh, with very detailed documentation. And we also have uh, a command line interface that you can interact with your own uh, workflow uh, or run it directly on the cloud. So PCOMPI include uh, these uh, processes, you upload a VCF file, and then you can define a set of disease genes and perform the annotation and the variant uh, class uh, filtering. And then the population filter is also an option, and then do the automated classification uh, that uh, uh, kind of really assign the gold, silver, metal, uh, bronze metal. And then that can be brought to a panel for formal classification utilizing ACMG rules. So I want to show two examples. One is uh, an AL study uh, sample uh, of exon sequencing on the right-hand side, and uh, left-hand side, and the right is the genome in a bottle sample whole genome sequencing. And you can see how through the various pipes of um, uh, the metal ceremony and uh, pecan pie that how the numbers whittle down. So um, I want to mention that this AL stands for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that we ended up uh, produced one gold medal, which is a uh, nonsense mutation on the ETV6 uh, gene. And this is the only uh, gold medal produced from this uh, sample and no gold medal produced from the genome in a bottle sample. And this variant uh, turned out to be a pathogenic variant missed by uh, uh, the scientists who initially uh, we're analyzing the data uh, using a family-based model. The reason being one of the kids uh, involved in the study, uh, she does not have the leukemia symptom, but harbors this ETV6 uh, nonsense mutation uh, variant. And the reason that was not, so it's missed by the standard family history, uh, family-based analysis. So we found that, and when they, the variant was, after we uh, identified this variant, they went back, checked for this particular uh, sibling, and find out uh, the 
the kid actually have uh, easy boots but haven't developed leukemia at her age. So this study actually was published in Lancet Oncology and the variant was discovered by our analytical process. And the second example I want to show is um, a, a FH uh, missense mutation which doesn't have a very high score from our metal ceremony um, automated classification. But by incorporating uh, you know, literature and other information from the panel, we raised this to be a pathogenic mutation as people were able to find functional studies and uh, relevance to the disease and additional information uh, through the manual curation uh, process so that we are able to find this causal variant through the, uh, by combining the automated analysis uh, with um, kind of the manual curation. So um, as we were initially were looking at more of the in silico based analysis, so we were approached by um, Terry Sossi from uh, Karolinska, Karolinska Institute. So he provided us with a list of the yeast and the mammalian uh, in vitro uh, assays on TP15 mutation and felt like this can help us to differentiate um, where population-based mutations are from the true pathogenic variant. And this is an example just showing the two TP15 mutations in the DNA binding domain. One has been found to be by yeast assay to be uh, benign and the other were uh, found to be um, pathogenic. So I provide the link there and you can see um, the full extent. Um, maybe I can show it here. Yeah. So you can see the full extent of the, the variant. Uh, this is a, a recurrent site and all the annotations can be put in a variety of uh, different um, analysis, in, including the in silico. Um, very uh, kind of a prediction uh, done by uh, various uh, analytical uh, process. So we also were uh, encouraged to know that uh, some of these variant prediction actually analysis will require involvement from a broad collaboration teams and some of these people may not be on the same um, physical location. So the pecan pie also have an interface uh, that, in, uh, that that will enable collaboration. So um, a, uh, a host can invite collaborators from different sources and uh, they can edit and collaborate on the variant annotation process. This is just one of the screenshots of uh, how we were in able to include theory from uh, Sweden to join us online uh, in one of the TP53 mutation process. And then we can reclassify the initial metals to some that incorporate the kid's um, functional assay to be more uh, fitting than the initial in silico prediction uh, gives to us. So this uh, entire pipeline actually took us a long time to develop. The reason is we've been, you know, running it on multiple cohorts and, and uh, uh, incorporating feedbacks from various clinicians and scientists uh, who have been using this tool. So the tool was developed by uh, Mike Edmondson and Amam Patel in my group. And we started developing metal ceremony in 2013 and the algorithm was used for the 2015 uh, New England paper. And then uh, we applied the same algorithm uh, for a study called Genome for Kids, which is our clinical uh, pipeline that, uh, genomics pipeline that sequenced all the germline and the somatic variants of every individual. So 2015, we also have uh, developed the variant in the pecan pie interface to enable variant annotation of about 1,500, uh, about 3,000 survivors of PDH cancer, and the study was published in JCO uh, 2018. And uh, the software is free, and I pay the computational cost for running pecan pie. It was launched in ASHG in um, 2017, and uh, the paper is published in last year. So right now, I have about 250 users, um, and uh, I know there's uh, even users from Saudi Arabia um, access to this uh, interface, which is very encouraging. 
And uh, I also want to say that during the revision of genome research, they really, um, the uh, reviewer and editor really pushed us on looking into how to make this tool available for non-cancer studies. So we have uh, implemented some interface to allow people to upload a custom uh, data, uh, data file for variant of importance and also to upload uh, a list of the gene interest. So we were able to um, actually utilize this interface recently to analyze uh, individuals uh, who have bone marrow transfer failures. And the result is actually almost 100% concordant with uh, the result they get from uh, sending samples to five to six different diagnostic groups. So the last subject I want to talk about is the integration of RNA-seq for driver variant uh, discovery. Uh, the first example I want to show is uh, looking at the splice site variant. And I want to point to a specific class of splice site variant we call the splice, site, uh, splice region. They're not at the canonical splice site and can contain, the so we need to find these as plus minus uh, 10 base pairs to the splice site and can contain very high false positive rate, uh, false positive rate, but if you combine this with RNA sequencing, so in this particular case, we are seeing a, a minus uh, eight uh, position uh, upstream of acceptocyte of SAF2, and you can see it introduces a, a novel splice uh, uh, acceptocyte that leading to uh, aberrant splice, uh, splicing um, uh, predicted to cause frame shift. Uh, so these are the variants that can be uh, missed if you don't have a good way of uh, assessing the splicing, uh, uh, aberrant splicing. The other important thing is looking at the non-coding regulatory variants, and this work was pretty much inspired by Tom Look's uh, a 2014 science paper, which they found a de novo insertion uh, in a leukemia cell line jackets, which lead to um, uh, novel mid binding sites, uh, and they were able to confirm this uh, in the chip seek and also find that uh, the tau one which is a target gene expression, show monoallelic expression uh, in the cDNA. So we have been uh, experimenting with this and was able to, uh, you know, use the information to discover one variant that uh, upstream of another oncogene, LMMO2. This is the inserted uh, basis, and we were able to uh, show that it introduces uh, a mid binding site, and uh, the variant uh, in the, uh, the heterozygous SNKs in the DNA by whole sequencing show at the RNA sequencing level, show monolith expression, and we were able to see overexpression of MLO2 in this region. Similarly, uh, we've been using this approach, actually we're able to identify structural variants, in this case here, that show a very high uh, overexpression, and this is again was confirmed by high C data that really shows a new TAD formulated by the translocated enhancer with um, the mix motor here. And then lastly, um, I just want to mention that we have uh, taken these coherence uh, into developing a systematic approach. So SysX is a new tool that we have developed for, for that purpose. It's under revision, and once the paper is accepted, uh, the tool will be available on GitHub and also on St. Jude Cloud uh, for publication. So that's all I have. Um, thank you uh, very much for, um, uh, for sharing, uh, for listening. Thank you, everybody. Doctors Roth and Karchin and Zhang, uh, we really appreciate you presenting today and for walking us through a few approaches um, to both generate and collate very valuable annotation resources. Um, this is a relatively fast-moving field and one that's highly relevant to both research and clinical work, so we appreciate hearing from all of you today. Uh, we do have a few questions, and I wonder um, if we could start with uh, Dr. Karchin. Um, although I think it, it applies to all of you, so please feel free to answer if you have other comments too, um, Dr. Zhang and, and Dr. Roth. Um, there are multiple annotation sources, as you showed, um, that we can choose from, and many annotations um, often are conflicting. 
Can you give some guidance on how to select among what's available? So, for instance, if someone's doing uh, work that's related to somatic versus germline variants, pediatric versus adult, clinical versus research questions, or even um, human versus mouse models, things like that. How do you decide uh, to filter which annotations and annotation tools are, are relevant? Am I am I am I muted? Am I muted here? I can hear Hello? you. Oh, okay. Yes. I wasn't sure if my mic was on or not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, we 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 have not been doing much quality control. We're just our 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 approach has just been to uh, try to put together as many tools as possible. Um, we have tools for somatic variants. We have tools for germline variants. Uh, we have tools for common variants and rare variants. Um, so your, the question is, how do you choose which ones to use? I think you would just go to the store and you would click around and look at things that look attractive, and then you'd flip around the the uh, the cards and you'd read the documentation, and you'd just probably figure it out for yourself. Um, I think we haven't really taken on the role of um, doing real. Uh, rigorous comparison between tools to tell people which ones we think are best. Sure. Yeah, this, is, this is Fritz Roth. I think it's a great question and we grapple with that all the time. We want to validate our map. So what, what source of annotation should we use? And for the genes where there's a, you know, embarrassment of riches, we set filters on ClinVar based on uh, the number of stars they give the review. So at least one star review status, meaning um, I think if I remember right, it means that the criteria for giving the annotation are at least provided, and ideally they follow ACMG uh, guidelines. Um, but uh, often we don't have enough variants, so we go into the conflictings and we say, okay, if um, if people either called it the U.S. or pathogenic and it wasn't the vast majority calling it, um, you know, the U.S., then we might include it in our bronze standard. Um, for benign, we're often short because we actually want to look at the rare benign, and there are not so many of those because many are benign only because they're common. You know, they, they don't get to full benign status unless they're common. Uh, so we, you know, will as a bronze standard go into Nomad and and take random variants or uh, filter for the ones that have been seen as homozygotes if there are enough of those available. Um, but it's a great question, and I wish I knew the perfect answer, but we don't have enough well, um, confidently annotated variants to do a lot of what we want to do. I, I would also say that there are um, organizations such as KG that are really actively working to try to identify what are the best tools for each task. Um, could you I want to just me? Hello? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to... Yeah, I think the, you know, from our experience, I think the disease relevance is uh, very, very important. It's not just the prediction determines the pathogenicity. Um, actually, the in silico prediction plays a relatively uh, lower um, limited role in the final classification based on our experience. And at times, uh, you know, the context is very important you know, things pre uh, predict benign, but uh, under certain uh, context, for example, in the somatic space, um, you know, some of the uh, variant, if there's um, under the particular oncogene background, they could be um, kind of uh, accelerating tumor growth. Um, on the other side, if it's on the uh, incorrect uh, cell lineage or um, background, they could be completely benign or even seeing the opposite effect. So I feel this is, a, from our experience, is always need to be working with biologists, oncologists, and people really understand the disease in addition to the in silico prediction um, methods that we use. I, I would just like to add one comment to this, is that don't write off the in silico prediction community so quickly, because those of us who develop these tools have worked very hard, and there's really been amazing progress in the past 10 years that I think people don't really appreciate how much better the tools have gotten. Um, I, I, so I, totally, I totally agree yeah. with that. Um, I, I read the question as uh, meaning where do we get the, the, the sort of gold standard variants against which to judge these tools, but I, I, I totally agree that the computational methods have not been that great, but they are getting better. And it's, it's, it's you know, watch this space for sure and don't write them off. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that in the right uh, disease context is very important. So when the in silico prediction was used in uh, genes known to be involved uh, in the disease, and they actually could be very powerful. So. Uh, my recent experience working with the bone marrow transfer failure uh, group that um, the in silico, uh, you know, among the candidate genes known to be involved in silico prediction turned out to be very powerful uh, in that context. Yeah, that definitely makes sense that context is important. I, I keep hearing that as well. Um, Dr. Cartridge, you mentioned KG, and I just wondered if you could tell people what, what that is. I'm not sure that everybody knows. Oh, sure. So this is the critical assessment of genome interpretation. This is a community-wide experiment that tries to objectively compare methods that do variant interpretation. Uh, And they do it by, uh, it's a double-blinded experiment uh, in which there's a prediction season in which uh, different groups are blinded given a list of variants to make predictions uh, for, and then Nobody knows the answer, and then at the end of the season, the answers are released and uh, objective assessors, not people who develop the methods, but independent assessors compare uh, people's predictions. So th- these, these types of experiments, I think, are very helpful in terms of seeing what methods can do and what they can't and which are the best and so forth. Thank you. I think there's more literature in this area, too. There's a February uh, genome biology uh, publication that tries to do an assessment of some of the computational algorithms. Um, and so they have a summary as well. And, and I know that there are other papers that are trying to do more of these comparisons to help inform people what context or, or what you know, specific um, types of ways they want to use the tool can be of utility to them. So um, Dr. Roth, one of the things you mentioned was the sparsity of data. So um, you know, many annotation tools and databases are sparse or perhaps biased towards already known cancer genes, especially the actionable genes, um, because many of the data sets informing those databases aren't necessarily agnostically designed. Um, is this an issue? How is this best handled in curated data sets? And I, I guess I'm, from all of you, what are your broader thoughts on what needs to happen uh, in the field moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of bias, one of the things we tried to get at was the um, we found that rare variants didn't behave exactly like common variants when you tried to train. So we were doing some computational prediction work here as well. And we found that we could improve our performance on a test set of rare variants um, if we only trained on rare variants, suggesting that there's something different about um, uh, common variants um, that is sort of confounds their usefulness um, to some degree in predicting pathogenicity. Um, so that's one source of bias. So we're looking for, we're increasingly looking for rare variants not likely to be pathogenic. So that's one form of bias. Another thing that some computational prediction methods have done in the past is to take many variants that are not annotated as pathogenic um, and treated them as, as you know, benign for the purpose of training, which I think it can often be fine. But um, many of the computational predictors have used um, variants from genes that are not annotated as being disease genes even. So they might actually be quite damaging for their gene, but but the gene doesn't cause a disease. Um, so we've we've also tried to hit that one. Um, I don't know, maybe others have other thoughts on that. Dr. Roth or Dr. Zhang, do you have any additional comments on that question? Um, I want to mention is that some of the, you know, the, there's a need to be a link between people perform mutagenesis experiment uh, in the biochemistry field versus, uh, on, you know, clinical oncologist who's looking at the patient level of uh, defining the pathogenicity of these variants because, uh, you know, many times uh, we think we are seeing a new variant, but uh, people who study the uh, the gene, uh, who you know, interested in uh, in the function of that particular gene, kind of already done these type of experiments for you in the past. So, how to enable uh, kind of the text mining approaches, be able to grab these, um, you know, the uh, these information, functional validation information from the literature uh, that's already published in the, published in a different field, 
can really help uh, enhance uh, the field of the variant classification that's being done at the clinical level. I am looking at some of the questions in the, someone is asking what is the difference between open cravat and the UCSC genome browser? Well, I, I was just going to say we've got a, got a few questions to compare open cravat to NOVAR, VEP, um, AVIA, um, USC genome browser. So maybe um, there's a few references that, that people are typically familiar with, such as the ones I just listed. Maybe you could compare open cravat to those tools. Right. Well, UCSC Genome Browser is not really designed for variant annotation. I guess, I mean, our competitors, I guess, are Anavar and VEP. I think at this time we have um, more tools in Open Cravat than Anavar and VEP, and I think we're faster. I think it's a faster tool. Uh, the, the processing time is faster. Um, but I think we're also the new kid on the block. I think we have a, probably have a smaller uh, community than Anavar and VEP because they've been around for many years. Um, I also believe that, so VEP is not something you can download. I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to think some of the comparisons. So uh, Open Cravat is not, it, we do have a website that you can use, but you can also install it locally. Uh, you can run it in the cloud. Um, so I know VEP is not something that you can install locally. This is, a, I believe this is just a website, as is UCSC Genome Browser is a very broad-based tool that does many, many types of genome interpretation and annotation, not specifically for variants. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I think, I think that's helpful for people to just understand the different types of tools in terms of the functions that they provide, USC Genome Browser versus um, sometimes they have annotations within that set, but that might be different than a tool like Anovar or VEP or Open Cravat. Um, one other question is a lot of the focus is on exons and, and exonic function. Do you know what's happening um, to annotate variants in non-coding regions? And, and this really is for any speaker that, that would like to answer that question. So Open Cravat has many non-coding variant annotations as well. We, we've never limited to just to uh, exome. And we're actively seeking more. Yeah, I want to kind of, I showed a few examples of uh, non-coding variant uh, in tumor, uh, not in the germline, but I, I think the challenge of the non-coding variant is uh, it does not have a readout like the protein coding. So you, and a lot of the, you know, the activities of uh, regulatory regions are very tissue specific. So uh, you have to really put in the specific disease context and have the specific tissue to be able to assessing, you know, are they going to cause, um, you know, lead to a uh, alterations on transcription factor binding. And uh, so the prediction actually was not very uh, robust. Many of the true, um, you know, the signals, uh, like things, I, examples I showed, the MIB, uh, uh, the, the insertion that lead to the uh, the novel MIP binding side, if you look at the p value of the prediction, they are not very, very high. But experimentally, they basically uh, lead to a creation of a super enhancer. So um, I think, um, you know, uh, experimental verification is definitely needed for um, any of the non coding variant um, based on the, you know, if the initial discovery was based on the prediction. Thank you. That's, uh, those are helpful comments. In terms of the um, sort of systematic experimental tests of variants, of course, we, it doesn't make sense for us to look at uh, intronic or other really non-coding variants in yeast because it, it doesn't um, really capture the, the biology of, of you know, gene regulation or splicing um, in the same way as a human cell would. But, uh, you know, we, we're definitely, we're working on putting constructs into human cells that have introns. And already there's some great work um, from uh, Leah Starita and others in Seattle um, where they're doing saturation genome editing. They published on BRCA1 
And the idea of doing, using CRISPR to mutagenize in the endogenous locus is really key um, that you can make non-coding changes and look at the cellular phenotype um, and be more confident that you're looking at the right regulation and splicing. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question for Dr. Roth. So um, there are multiple ways in which people are assessing the effects of variants um, in terms of these multiplex assaying variant effects approaches. Uh, for instance, CRISPR screens you talked about towards the end of your talk. Um, what are your thoughts on disease-related phenotypes that are compatible with screens beyond measuring things like growth rate or cell growth? Um, what would you like to see in the field specifically sort of assessing oncogenic effects? Um, well, are there other examples? Yeah, I mean, so for, for some gains of function, you, you know, you really have to know what is the phenotype uh, that you're looking for. Uh, but for loss of function, it, with a caveat I'll give in a minute, um, I actually don't think it has to be a, a, a disease phenotype um, to have a great assay, right? So I talked about the um, MTHFR map, and I didn't show you, but it actually does a decent job at identifying pathogenic variants. We published the CBS maps and comodulin maps using yeast and you know honestly if this if you can make a map that does a great job of predicting pathogenic variation using a fitness phenotype in yeast uh you know that says that all that really what we need to do is identify the, you know a, a, any assay for the function of a gene and uh and and that's the right place to start before you do you know multicellular organism phenotypes etc okay that's that's the first line but there's nuance and caveat that, um, you know, for example, when we put both CBS and MTHFR genes um, into yeast, the enzymatic function works, but each of them have a C-terminal regulatory domain that, um, at least under our assay conditions, doesn't seem to be working properly. So our map is not good at the C-terminus. And so as long as you know what the limitations are, um, and maybe we need a multi-organismal phenotype um, to properly test variants in those regions. Fortunately, there aren't too many um, disease variants in those regions for those genes. But, you know, definitely sometimes you're going to need a more complicated phenotype. But I think, you know, as a first pass until you're, you know, proven otherwise, you know, we don't have to look at homocystinuria and the, you know, resulting developmental defects, cognitive impairment, lens luxation. You know, we don't have to be looking at those phenotypes um, to, to uh, identify pathogenic variants in the enzymes that are, up, you know, that are um, associated with those phenotypes as long as we can assess the function. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Dr. Zhang or, or uh, Karthi, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, the one of the challenges uh, is the cellular context has to be correct, uh, at least in the different cancer uh, subtypes that we dealt with. So uh, because a lot of the, you know, kind of the cancer-related oncogenic activation that occur is uh, these, um, you know, genes were expressed in the embryo uh, embryonic cell stage uh, and get reactivated uh, during uh, cancer development. So it's kind of the lineage mismatch that lead to kind of the trouble for, um, you know, for the cancer cells to have accelerated growth. So the, to test these uh, phenotypes, uh, it's actually um, you have to do that either in uh, a model system uh, like Xenograph mouse model that created from the patient samples and looking at whether inhibition of the oncogene will have um, any specific effect of uh, curtailing the growth of the tumor cells or making using the cell lines that, that were derived from that, uh, that harbors a variant and uh, perform additional manipulation in the cell line uh, to look at the phenotypes uh, to see if there's any, uh, you know, the, the deaths, uh, the, you know, the viability and all the others uh, that could happen by um, removing the variants. So um, it's not an easy job, that's all I can say. <laughs> so I would just like to say that that tools like Open Cravat are really intended to be before extensive experimental testing. So in, in our view, you often have a very large number of variants that, and you'd like to understand which ones are pathogenic. So our hope with computational tools is that we can make it easy for you 
to narrow down to just a few really important ones. And then you can uh, use more expensive experimental resources to really explore those in depth. I certainly agree you would never want to just end with a computational prediction and feel confident. You always want to move on to experiment. Mm -hmm. But you can't do experimental validation for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, a, lot of, a lot of these tools and approaches are very complementary, um, and it sort of just depends on the user to know, understand sort of what approaches uh, to take and what kind of tools can be most useful for their particular research or clinical question. Um, yeah, Dr. Ross, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I just want to also comment uh, following what Rachel has uh, mentioned is that uh, at times uh, kind of the inheritance model can also be helpful. So some of the diseases, uh, they are autosomal recessive. So if you, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, Diamond Schwartz syndrome, uh, that, you know, there are genes like SBDS that were known to be acting only on the hetero, uh, you know, like autosomal recessive model. And if you find one loss of function mutation, and uh, that's kind of a, definitely a candidate, and you find in the same uh, patient another missense mutation predicted as deleterious by majority of the tools um, and it's not in the general population, you have a pretty good bet on this is the one that you're looking for because it matches with the, the inheritance pa um, pattern and the disease. So we have a couple more questions, um, one for Dr. Roth, which is specific to the, the data set that you showed. Are the data that you're generating shared, um, I, I know you mentioned MAVE-DB, um, are they available in other ways too? And then another question is, um, can this functional information be linked to tools like Open Cravat? Uh, sure. Uh, so the MTHFR data is uh, in MAVE-DB, it's in private mode right now because it's still changing. <laughs> so we keep uh, sort of nudging our analysis pipeline, and uh, and and so basically we uh, our our uh, process has been to submit to BioArchive, and when we submit to BioArchive, the data um, is open um, on MaveDB. Um, but you know if we're not even ready to put on BioArchive, then it's still volatile. I think we're about ready to do it for for MTHFR. So I'd I'd look for that in the next um, few weeks. I hope. Um, and uh, but, but yeah. we've been talking for about a year about bringing Maeve DB into Open Cravat. So there were some technical right. challenges, but we're still working on it. We do have Leah Storita's uh, BRCA1 saturation mutagenesis assay results, and we'd like to have all of Maeve DB. So that will happen. Great. I'll help <laughs> if I can. That's great. Um, one more question question for Dr. Karchin. Uh, you had mentioned um, some different ways to utilize the tool. One question is the interactive viewer for viewing the variants at different levels. Can it run locally or require, does it require your server? No, no, it runs locally. Yeah. So uh, it, runs, it runs in your web browser, but it's, it's just on your machine. It's a local web server on your machine. So that's the nice thing about the private versions is that if it's locally on your machine, your data is really private and protected. Great. Um, I just want to check with the host. I know we're kind of getting close to, to wrapping up. Are there any other questions that people have that I might have missed? I think we got all of them. not seeing any indication of new questions. So thank you everybody for presenting today. Very much appreciated it. Um, it's a lot of content to try to get into in a relatively short amount of time. And um, it was very nicely done. It was a nice way to see what some examples of the tools that are out there um, that people can use are and, and some nice discussions in terms of um, what directions we might need to head in the near future. Um, so I'll turn it over to NIH to say some concluding remarks and thanks again. Great, thank you so much, uh, Tabitha, for managing the Q&A, and I want to thank everyone for their attendance today and for our presenters for really a uh, fantastic uh, presentation, um, uh, Dr. Ross, and Dr. Carton, and Dr. Zhang. Uh, we really thought that the presentation was great and the discussion was uh, really helpful. 
Uh, we welcome everyone's feedback to inform our future webinars. Uh, lastly, let me just note that we have uh, our next Seek Safe webinar is scheduled for May 12th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, and we'll feature a presentation on sequencing in diverse populations by Emer Kinney. And you can register uh, for that webinar now on our Seek Space uh, website. So thank you everyone uh, for uh, a great webinar. Uh, we really um, we really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye.